The open secret about X-Men in the 1960s is that it was a failure. It was one of the last original creations of that original blossoming period of the 1960s. They were intended to be like another Fantastic Four. You have to put it in context. The X-Men was never an A-category series any more than Iron Man was. Stan and Jack did the opening few issues and then handed it off to other writers, other creators. For most of the 60s, it was the lousiest selling Marvel title, or close to it. In 1969, it was canceled. The last bunch of issues of X-Men, which were done by Roy Thomas and Neil Adams, got a little attention and, and there was a little uptick in sales. The irony was that Roy Thomas and Neil Adams' run on the X-Men was groundbreaking in its own way. It's just that the tracking network was so primitive that Marvel didn't realize they had a hit on their hands until eight months after the first issue came out, and by then Neil had gone back to DC, so too little too late. So the decision was made, let's bring X-Men back as a reprint book. We'll just reprint the old stories, and if it sells, that's good enough. So that's what X-Men was for about five or six years, between 1970 and 1975. The characters still existed in and around the Marvel Universe, and the series certainly had its fans. Fans of the day would ask Roy or Stan or whomever about when are you going to bring back the X-Men. It wasn't like there was a huge wellspring, but there was a dedicated following. Marvel's president moving into the mid-70s was a fellow by the name of Al Landau. And Al Landau got into the business by being the person who had licensed Marvel Comics to be sold in international properties. One of the things that, that occurred to him is, if we had a book that had characters in it from all of these different places around the globe, maybe that one would sell in really well and it would make a lot more money. There was a meeting, and I believe it was Roy who said, well, maybe we do that and we can do that with the X-Men. I could take one or two of the original X-Men and we can have all these other X-Men from around the world and that'll be the thing. And so that was the starting point for what became Giants as X-Men 1. Stan didn't pitch. I mean, he was the boss. So for him to pitch something is, when should we do it? Now. How do we do it? The best you can. And he and Roy talked about it. Then Roy, I think, turned to Len. Len Wein was a very famous comic book writer and editor who worked both at Marvel and other companies throughout the late 1960s all the way up through the 2000s. And Len has the distinction of being the creator of that time period who came up with the most stuff. For Marvel, the big ones obviously are Wolverine and the uh, all new, all different X-Men. But up to about the mid 2000s, he had the, about the best batting average of anybody in terms of coming up with stuff in comics that would then be translated into film and television. Dave Cockrum was one of the preeminent young artists of the 1970s. He was in the 70s the cutting edge of superhero costume design. Of all the people that would design new superheroes or redesign old superheroes, he was kind of at the forefront of that and his looked the most modern. With Dave, you had reams and reams of paper. I mean, he did, I think, 35 or 40 design pieces for Phoenix. Different costume designs, different costume colors, taking the cape off one design, putting it on another, combining them in different ways. He would juggle the figure until he found the visual iconography that worked. When you have access to an artist as creatively gifted as Dave Cockrum, you want to utilize that palette to the best extent. Roy tasked Len and Dave with creating the X-Men. He and Len sat down and went over all this stuff, and he just had like books full of designs and characters and things, stuff he'd come up with, and they pulled together the characters that became the all new, all different X-Men. He was the best there is at what he did, which was tell stories, create characters, create universes. Without Dave, the visual concept of the X-Men would be non-existent. The premise was, how do we introduce the new team? The one rubric that Stan established for the team is he wanted it to be international. The idea was to bring as much diversity in form and reality as possible. 
out of that discussion, you have an indigenous American, a Russian, a German who doesn't look human at all. Nightcrawler went through a couple of iterations. Dave came up with him one night while he was in the service. They were out somewhere and there was some shelling going on or something. It was a dangerous night and he sat in this foxhole or wherever and came up with a superhero character. Storm was originally two different characters which Dave folded together and created Aurora. And you had Colossus. Here's a superhero who's a good guy, a hero on the team, and a Russian citizen. Utilizing Colossus as a member of the team in 1974, how would we play it in terms of the United States' relation to the Soviet Union? It's a much wider array of backgrounds and personality types than you tended to have in any comics. Now these guys are the X-Men, not the guys that you know. There is no warning really whatsoever. It's like, not like there was an issue before that that could say, next issue, the new X-Men. And they hated it. They hated it. And you can actually see it even in the letters that they printed. There was a real hardcore bunch of X-Men fans that wanted X-Men back. We got letters upon letters from readers. Why had you taken the previous team away? How could you turn the X-Men into this cheap advertising? And pretty much they were told, you're gonna get the X-Men back, except all the guys that you love are gone now and it's all these new weirdos. In the office we were all looking at it and saying, this is bloody brilliant. And it took a while for that sentiment to, to shift and for the new team to catch on with the older fans. I always had a popularity with the readers that came to it in the 70s. The audience reaction pre-publication is entirely different from the reaction post-publication. But we knew from certainly the reader reaction from the mail that we would get it, that we had a hit. The question was how could we exploit it to the best and most positive extent. In those days, Chris had come on staff as an assistant editor. I was working on a college internship. Marvel was nothing like it is today. Chris was just hanging around in the offices at whatever point where Len and Dave Cockrum were coming up with the plot for Giant Size X-Men number one. And as it's told, Chris is the one who suggested to them how they get rid of the menace in that Krakoa this huge island that turns out to be a, a singular entity that's alive. Len kept trying to shut the door in my face and I kept slipping in anyway. And Len at the same time decided it was time to move on. And for the chance to work with Dave Cockrum, I basically threw him to the floor and said, I want it. And Len said yes. It really wasn't until Chris started writing the book regularly and started to dig into it that the underlying mutant metaphors started to really come to the fore. The actual mutant experience as metaphor for human experience that really became the stock and trade of the X-Men and the real strength of what Chris and his various collaborators did didn't really develop fully and become an integrated core part of that series until they were working on it regularly. Len planted the first seeds. The key element here was that I got a hold of it from that very first issue. Even though X-Men 94 was substantially Len's plot, 95 was mine, 96, for better or worse, was a necessary fill-in. By the time Dave and I got our story underway, which was sort of 97, but definitely 98 to 100, we pretty much knew what we wanted to do and the direction we wanted to go. And that was where I think we all started dancing down the road to what the X-Men evolved into over the next 16 years.